Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies at Charles Darwin University. Welcome to Outrider 46, Understanding PhD Examiners. Let me tell you how we got here. About 99% of the emails that I receive from students complain about their supervisors, and the other 1% complain about professional development or complain about the lack of funding for higher degree students. Right, now all of those I'm sure are legitimate concerns but students are placing the emphasis and their concerns in the wrong place because examination is really the moment, the key moment in a doctoral program, and yet we talk about it so rarely. So in this Outrider, we're addressing this rather odd and unusual emphasis from PhD students. You are not going to know your examiner. You will have no role in the selection of your examiner, and I'm aware all sorts of crazy conflicts of interests exist in this space, often what I describe as dial a mate examiner. So your supervisor has a mate, dials him up, sends your thesis to him or them, and then of course that supervisor sends their students to your supervisor. Yucky, dial a mate, star chamber. Luckily and wonderfully, regulation and governance now exists to stop this from occurring. So examination is and must be a moment of terror and fear for PhD students. It is a legitimate terror. It is a legitimate fear. But we need to address the fear and the terror and we need to talk about it, not sort of endlessly discuss the relationship with the supervisor, because there's one thing you can guarantee, your supervisor won't be examining your thesis. So I've often described the examination of a PhD as a dark art. It's a mysterious space that exists around an examiner. We make a judgment. And our first responsibility, and really our major responsibility, is to uphold international standards. You see, the result that we grant in Darwin, in the Northern Territory, must be equivalent to the result given in Saskatoon at the University of Saskatchewan. It's got to be equivalent to the result that's given in Singapore at the National University of Singapore. This is about international standards, not world famous in Darwin. Examining a PhD, those of us that have the privilege of examining, know that it is a privilege. And we must care for the student, we must care for the research project, but our number one priority is to ensure that doctoral standards are maintained. So I know this is frightening for students because how do you know that you've reached the required standard? Now, what adjective am I going to use here? Sloppy supervisors try to control the fear from their students by pretending that and telling students that peer review articles are key. No, they're not. Peer reviewing and examination are completely different processes and outstanding theses are granted a one or an A every single day that do not have a single publication in them or from them. Peer review is not examination. PhD examination is a dark art. So today I'm going to talk about this dark art. I'm going to talk about you as a PhD student and how you can control what you can control, how you can manage and organise your thesis for a successful examination for your examiner. Okay, now PhD examiners come to the process wishing you well. We want you to succeed. But remember, PhD examiners, using that old cliche, have one job. We have one job. To make sure that your thesis reaches the minimum standard of what is international doctoral education. That's the job. Their job is to make sure that you reach that benchmark for academic protocols, for originality, for research integrity, for academic integrity. That's what we're looking for. We have proxies for these attributes, and that's what I'm going to talk about with you today. So you know what we're lo looking for so that you can become and you can control what you can control. So today we are talking about examination. We are beginning with the end in mind. Let me tell you what examiners are looking for. Let's do one. Oh yeah, let's start there. The size of the thesis. 
A key worry that emerges when I unpack a thesis or download a thesis is the size of it. So last year I failed a PhD. It was 125 pages in length. That is the length of a coursework master's dissertation. There were three examiners. All three failed it cleanly. Out. Failed. Now when I opened it and saw the size, uh, I thought, oh, we might be in a bit of trouble here, but let's give the benefit of the doubt. But of course, we were in trouble and the thesis did fail. Now, I know so many of you out there are going to quote a series of historical theses to me from physics and mathematics from the 1940s, 50s and 60s. Bless you. Now, colleagues, do you really think that a thesis submitted 80 years ago in some very specific disciplines has any generalizable information to give us in 2024. Do you really think that? Okay. Now, what we need to do, if you're interested in that, look at current mathematics theses, or more importantly, look at current physics theses, and you'll see they're always within the length and the parameters of what a PhD is. And remember, I have some expertise in this. I am married to a physicist, so I see clearly a lot of physics PhDs and know how they are constructed. And remember, why, why have theses changed? Why have they got bigger? Well, colleagues, it's pretty straightforward. We know more, there's more knowledge, there's more universities, there's more academics writing research. The scope and scale of knowledge has increased. And generalizing a mathematics thesis from Cambridge in 1947 to the University of Pretoria is not effective, it's not real, it's not truthful, it's not authentic. So don't talk about these earlier theses like that has relevance 80 years later. If a thesis is short, it has proxies for other issues. Let me explain. The point of a PhD is to show a mastery over a very, very small field. So you've got to show mastery, but over a small field of knowledge. You're needing to prove that you are an expert in that slice of knowledge and that you can manage a lot of material. The point of a PhD is that you've read a lot, you can manage a lot of material, and you can organise it with rigour and clarity. Now, if I see a thesis the size of an honours thesis or a capstone thesis or a coursework master's degree, then I start to worry about the scope and scale of this thesis. Part of what a PhD requires is your capacity to get a lot of information and manage it. If it feels like an honours dissertation, you haven't got a lot of information and managed it. The most frequent statement that accompanies an examination report, and this might help you, so if a student gets a 4 or a D, which is a revise and resubmit, the most common examiner comment is, quote, this thesis lacked scope and scale, end of quote. That might help you. I read thousands of examination reports, right, and have for a decade. And we probably don't tell students that enough, that when a 4 or a D is granted, it's scope and scale, that phrase, that is called out. So one of the requirements of a PhD is that you can manage scope and scale. You can manage the complexity of contemporary knowledge. How do I know that you've fulfilled a SOC, a significant original contribution to knowledge, if you haven't presented the field appropriately, if you haven't demonstrated a mastery of already existing research. Two, bibliography and reference list. Yeah, let's go there. When I open a PhD, and this has been researched internationally, by the way, when examiners open a PhD, the first place they go is to the reference list or the bibliography. When I do this, I'm looking for three things. I'm looking for completeness, I'm looking for contemporary sources from the last two years, and I'm looking for accurate referencing. Now, obviously, accurate referencing is you know, have you got your academic literacies in place? Can you reference properly? One would hope so. But also I want to see the broad spectrum of scholarly work, okay? I need to see the historic, the legacy literature that is important. But I also need to see a large number of sources from the last two years. 
One of the great problems, in fact, I would argue one of the greatest problems of long candidatures, so students that are enrolled for a long time, is their literature review looks tired. Their reference list looks tired, it's baggy, it's got references from 2008 and 2009 and 2018 and 2019, and they look tired. They look dated. So I'm not suggesting don't include important references, I'm suggesting the exact opposite. But what I'm suggesting is you must show absolutely contemporary knowledge from the months before, months before you submit. Completeness does matter. And remember, as an examiner, I read a lot. I read a lot of books, I read a lot of articles every single day every single day. So I know what I'm looking for in your bibliography and reference list. And if I don't see contemporary sources and the big names, I start to worry. And remember, we're only five minutes in looking at a thesis. I haven't done anything yet. I've taken it out of the package, I've looked at the size of it, and I've looked at the reference list. So let's go to three and stay with the reference list and explain what happens when I see textbooks and <laughs> dictionaries in your reference list. So, I worry in a thesis if I see very basic textbooks, I see dictionaries that are used as references. Let me explain why. A PhD that I failed in the United Kingdom during the oral exam, and can I say my co-examiner also, and of course independent, until you come to the oral exam, my other examiner also had failed it before coming to the oral exam and on the same grounds. And the grounds were that in the bibliography, basically there were just... US and UK textbooks, sort of handbooks and dictionaries. Now the student in this case was attempting to enact some really, really complicated theorisation from the top end of town. So they were attempting and talking about structuralism and post-structuralism and deconstruction. And of course they were reading rubbish textbooks. And so they had actually no idea about what those three terms actually mean. And they were wrong most of the time and, let's be kind, inelegant the rest of the time. And this, of course, was caused by their reading. The problems in the thesis were caused by the bibliography using the most basic nonsense that they were reading. You see, if you read nonsense, you produce nonsense. If you read high-quality scholarly monographs and peer reviews, you read quality stuff, you write quality stuff. And we know if we start to see undergraduate textbooks in the, in the reference list, it starts to drag the expertise of the thesis right down. Four, organisation of ideas. Now, many Australian universities still do not have an oral exam. Where we're at now is about a third of the Australian universities do. Can I say they're a bit uneven in their governance and regulation, but still, two-thirds of Australian universities do not have an oral exam. And that means, for you, all examiners have is your script. They're not meeting you, they're not talking with you, they simply have the words on the page or the words on the screen. And their examination comes from that process. So all you have to show your wares, your ability if you will, is the written presentation of that thesis. Do you know how to construct a paragraph? Do you know how to organise a chapter? Now if you don't, you're gone. In a system with an oral exam, you're given a bit more of the benefit of the doubt. So an examiner will say to you, Phil, what happened in chapter five? Between section two and section three, there's a jump there. Could you explain to us what's going on? So you're given a chance to sort of explain errors and problems and so forth. But in many Australian universities, you don't have that chance. You got the script, you got the document, that's it. If there's anything wrong with the organisation of your thesis, an examiner will call you out. So you have no plan B. So organisation of your thesis really matters. So make sure that your examiner is calm. When they look at your contents page, they see a rational, logical progression of ideas. Your SOC, your significant original contribution to knowledge is clearly specified. Five, poorly written theses and or the use of an editor. Okay, let's do this. Now, I'm not telling you not to use an editor. I lost that battle 10 years ago. You are legally allowed to use an editor, but you must state that you've used one in your acknowledgements. You must do that. 
if you use an editor, you have to declare it. And that's fine, that's your choice. But I want to say something to the students out there that have not used an editor. I think you should be given credit for not using an editor. So at the conclusion of your acknowledgement state, no editor was deployed in the construction or editing of this thesis, full stop. So then the examiner gives you credit for the work that you have done in editing and drafting your thesis. So I'm very comfortable. When I see an editor was used in the construction of the thesis in, an, in the acknowledgements, I know it's legal, but I'm uncomfortable. And let me tell you why. Part of being an examiner is I'm examining your ability to communicate your ideas. Now, if an editor's been used, I haven't got clear vision of your ability to draft and edit your own work. So if I see an editor used, I always sort of question, what's the student's work? Can they actually do it? Now, I know I lost that battle 10 years ago, but examination is a dark art. It's about impressions as much as regulations. So if you decide not to use an editor, put that in your acknowledgements and you gain credit for that from your examiner. Six, short introduction. Now, after I've looked at the reference list, I've had a look at the abstract, how are we going, all cool, my next stop, is to the introduction and once more length is important. The introduction must be over five pages. If we're under five pages, and five is small, but if we're under five pages I know we're really in trouble. The introduction has to set the scene and configure the landscape for the thesis. Why am I reading this? Why should I care? Why should I care? These are big questions, and you've got to address these questions in your introduction. What are we doing here, team? Why am I here? Why am I about to give you three or four days of my life? Explain that to me. Do that in the introduction. And a short introduction demonstrates that the student has no sense of scope and scale and the significance of the research. Seven, a short conclusion. Now, a short conclusion is not as serious as a short introduction. A short conclusion simply shows that the student was tired and they ran out of words, and I understand that. But the mark does tumble when we see sort of no conclusion, really. I'll give you a couple of examples. I had two fantastic theses that I examined a few years ago that were an, uh, heading for an A and a 1. I went, oh, yes, 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 great, right? So we, we, we're heading for an A1, great. It's a fabulous feeling as an examiner. Oh, this is great work. And then, of course, I turned to the conclusions and they were two pages. So the mark tumbled from an A1 to a C3, major corrections. And, of course, the major correction was write a conclusion. So a short conclusion simply demonstrates that the student wasn't really able to, to punch it home. They weren't really able to say, this is why it matters. This is the significant original contribution to knowledge. Thank you for being a part of this journey. Confidence, energy, further work. This is brilliant. Thank you for sharing this time. Hasn't this been amazing, right? That's what a great conclusion does. Eight, messy formatting. Right, so when I flick through the pages of a printed thesis, and I'm laughing because I've got two on my desk in front of me, or I am moving and scrolling through digital theses, and the headings are different sizes, different fonts are used, there's random blank pages everywhere, the captions and the diagrams look a bit weird, everything's a bit messed up. It looks chaotic, and therefore those formatting issues become a much greater worry for me, because when I see chaos in form, I think, wow, is there chaos in content? So I have to really look at the construction of the science, the methodology, the knowledge system. So don't assume that a Microsoft template is all you're going to need. I've seen people spend months of their life destroyed by wrangling a Microsoft template. You don't need a template. If you use one, that's great, but don't automate your organisation of your PhD, because problems will emerge when you do. Because firstly, all the resultant scripts start to look the same, but also they start to reveal the same problems as well. 
So when I see a chaotic presentation, I do worry, and that worry stays in my mind. So with the digital submission in particular, and most universities now have a digital submission, please make sure, go through carefully. Every single page is well organized, and at that point you're going, yep, PDF it. PDF it immediately, and then it'll be fine. And my final point on this one is, can I say to all those people that are still of the ilk where they're saying, let's staple the publications into the thesis and pretend that the articles are chapters. You know those people? Don't do that. Please take the article out of the formatting for the journal. It looks shockingly terrible. It looks like a jigsaw puzzle that was never really properly put together. So have standardised formatting. It can be the article if that's what you want to do, but have it in the standardised text format of the rest of the thesis. Because think about it, if we're going, and by the way, I've marked probably nearly a thousand PhDs at this point in my life, and this is important, not one of them has presented an article in its original format from the journal. So whenever anyone says, oh, everyone does this, that's nonsense. It's nonsense. So it's the reason I don't see it is, you know, I'm a respected examiner and people respect my time and I'm very grateful and I respect the student. But remember, if you're just stapling together some articles as they appeared in a journal, that is disrespectful for the examiner and the examiner's time. And remember, I can't say this often enough, peer reviewing is not examination. They're different. Don't think they have a relationship. They don't. Take the time, create consistent formats and fonts. Nine, the SOC. The significant original contribution to knowledge is buried somewhere and I can't find it. The abstract is everything to a PhD. And soon after I read the bibliography reference list, I'm hammering straight into that abstract. Now, I know the candidate's gonna be in trouble when I read a weird abstract. An abstract sort of meanders about, has a vibe, stops at methods for a while, has a bit of a chat. And what are we doing here? What are we doing here? The sock must be listed in your abstract. If the candidate is presenting these synthesizing arguments, so we've got you know, a long methods chapter, a long literature review, long, 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 and it looks like it's synthesizing knowledge, then I start to think it's a master's degree. Okay, so a PhD has a significant original contribution to knowledge. It transcends synthesis. So you will immediately relax and make your examiner incredibly happy if in the second sentence of your abstract you use the sentence, my original contribution to knowledge is brilliant. So this means that the definition of the PhD is intact. This is significant, I think, team. If you've never thought about what makes a PhD a PhD, it is a significant original contribution to knowledge. That's what it is. If an examiner has to try and find yours, we panic. We worry, where is the sock? Where is the sock? So you relax us all by second sentence of the abstract, this is the sock, girlfriend, and we go, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Ten, the supervisor did not sign off the examination. I've got workarounds for it, don't panic, but let me tell you what goes on here. You see, these days, and students probably are not told this as much as they should, these days, examiners get a lot of stuff from the university, right? They get the thesis, but they also get authorship forms confirming co-authorship. We get authenticate or text matching reports. We get all sorts of research integrity and academic integrity information, which is absolutely tremendous. That's great. So we don't just get the thesis. We get all sorts of proxies that show that there's been good regulation and governance in place for this thesis. Now, if publications are inserted in the thesis in some form, there is an actual form that confirms how much of the work has been done by the student and other parties, and the other parties must sign off their contribution. Remember, if an examiner has any doubt that this is not your work, then we have to return the thesis to the university. I've done that twice. So I've read the thesis and I've gone, 
I don't think this is the student's work. And I've returned the thesis unexamined to the university. And interestingly, in both those cases, all the other examiners did the same thing. Isn't that amazing? So we need to have a guarantee that the person whose name's on the front wrote the work. But in such a system, it becomes very, very clear, very, very quickly, if the supervisor has not approved the thesis moving to examination. So this means we see that the supervisor hasn't signed off, that they've read the final draft of the thesis, and for some reason, perhaps they don't believe it will pass. So if we have any sense that the supervisor hasn't signed off the thesis in either the paperwork supplied by the university or in your acknowledgements, we start to worry. So if you've thanked your mum, your dad, your partner, your former partner, your kids, your budgery guard, your poodle, and you don't thank your supervisor, we go from happy, happy, joy, joy to DEFCON 5 in about four seconds. So if your supervisor is absent, be calm. You know, stuff happens all the time, but don't do an acknowledgements page. Seriously, don't thank your budgie. If you can't thank your supervisor, don't have an acknowledgement page, and then the problem doesn't exist for the examiner to find. So make sure all your paperwork is in place, the authorship protocols have all been signed off, and the examiner has no sense that there were any problems through the process. Now I know because of the attrition rates of PhDs, which in the US is reported at 50%, 50% of the students that start don't finish, all the attention is on students, supervisors and attrition. And that means that examiners and examination is rarely talked about. And we don't talk about the failed theses enough. There are only a very small number, one to two percent of theses fail each year, small number. But what's not a small number is 10 to 15 percent of theses are granted a D or a four. That is a revise and resubmit. The student has to re-enroll and go through the entire examination process again. I always say to my students, start with the end in mind. And I always remember my late husband, Professor Steve Redhead, used to say something when I was a young, young academic. And he said, ah, oh, nah, nah, nah. And I now realise, of course, yeah, as I'm old, uh, that he was actually right. And Steve said, the most important job a supervisor ever does is select examiners. And he was absolutely right. Supervision matters, but not in the way that students think it does. So what do you know about your supervisor? Has your supervisor got a large number of students through their PhD? And have they done that without relying on a star chamber, without relying on a dilemmate examination process? Does your supervisor know the line between a pass and a fail, between uh, major corrections sort of okay, and a revise and resubmit. These are incredibly hard standards to determine. And please remember your audience, a PhD is not a journal article. Your examiner is not a peer reviewer. The systems are different. Examiners are making an international quality assurance judgment about the calibre of your research. Therefore, respect the process. And in the final year of your PhD, just start to shift your vista a little bit and move from the student view or the supervisor's view and start to think about the examiner's view. Think about any triggers for concern that you are creating for the examiner. And that may result in examiners worrying about the thesis and you getting a result lower than you really deserve. So remember, your priority is to calm the examiner. Make us feel confident and relaxed in your research integrity and your academic integrity. And when you do that, you do well. And I want you to do well. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.